All right, welcome back. Now, a report on Kenyan manufacturing shows that while women have made advances in the country's mechanized workplaces, men still own most formal businesses and hold better paying jobs. All well, the report prepared for the Kenya Association of Manufacturers by the International Center for Research on Women found that women accounted for just 17 percent of the formal manufacturing sector in 2019. This was up 1 percent from the previous year. Now, researchers found that most female-owned manufacturing operations are micro, small, and medium enterprises operating in the informal sector. Well, Flora Mutahi, who is the CEO and founder of Melvin's Marsh International, joins me in studio now. She is a seasoned entrepreneur spanning over 26 years in the manufacturing sector and is one of the few women in the manufacturing industry who has defied the odds. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you very much for the invite, Victoria. Oh, absolutely. I guess we can begin from the start because you have quite the interesting story, Flora. Mm -hmm. I've heard it several times. <laughs> you chose to do the rather unconventional, unpopular route of going into business at a time people were going for law, engineering, medicine. What pushed you in that direction? Very interesting um, question, and it's true. You know, everybody will be like, did you fail? What happened? Did you not get a job? How can I help? I mean, I remember when I first even went to the, one of the supermarkets to try and get listed, and the guy was like, what are you doing here? What happened? Why, you know? And I had the same brand from my parents, you know? I thought we took you to school, and right. you know, what is this about? But I was one of those very restless children, always wanted to solve issues, always solve problems, and I was like, why can't we do that? Why can't we do that? I had very empowering parents, you know? Mm -hmm. Do it, you know, what, what, what could be your issue? And then I went, I chose the auditing route because I was, you know, basically it came easy to me and um, I worked for nine months. But, and I worked coincidentally in a manufacturing place. Mm -hmm. And during the day, I would actually be on the factory floor looking at machines and everything. And my boss would come and be like, hang on, hang on, hang on, I'd quickly try. So after nine months of sort of like, you know, cat and mouse, I said, who am I being on it? So I quit. And I went into the manufacturing space and um, I guess the rest is history. No, absolutely. And why tea? How did you come upon that as the product? Interestingly, as um, a lot of people don't know, my first product was free-flowing salt. Uh -huh. So I, I was sitting down having lunch, I think we were with my mom, and, and the salt was a dry, very wet, purplish looking. Mm. And I said, why don't we have free-flowing salt? And she's like, what's that? I said, salt that comes out of the salt shaker, it's dry all the time. Yeah. Why don't you make it? You know, was the next question. And I said, actually, why not? So I went, I found out how to make it, and I put it in market. And I took it to market and um, when I first made my first sale, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, because of course I was very new in business, young. And um, I realized I can't make money in this. And two weeks later I said, I need a new product. And at the time I had a habit of putting ginger in my tea. And again, I asked myself, hmm, why is tea such a flat uh, market? There's only black tea and then you have to do it yourself. And I said, this is interesting. And again, I went and researched that and I said, ah, voila. I put the two together and I said, this can happen. And that is how the ginger tea sort of came about. Um, coincidentally for me, the government had just lifted a monopoly or 19 year monopoly or only one company could package tea. Mm. So I said, ah, another one. And then also the other one was, um, I was very, I was traveled. Yeah. So I was like, why don't we have Kenyan tea? You know, the t once you get acquired to Kenyan tea, I'm like, do these people know Kenyan tea? And you could never get Kenyan tea out of the country. Yeah. And I realized 97% of our tea is sold in bulk for people to go and brand and put in their other names. So that sort of got me hooked on and I said, I have got to crack this. And I guess 28 years later, I'm still trying to, you know, to ride that wave. Right, it's interesting because what it seems like for you that worked well, ingenuity, you just, you found an opportunity, you ran with it and also timing yes. worked in your favor. Yes. All this time, you know, that has passed, how have you kept your brand relevant in a very competitive space? True, um, and it, you're right, manufacturing and actually even the foods is, is very competitive. And I think usually what, what you have to do is, first of all, be jealously, jealously follow your consumer. Mm. Where are they? What are they doing? What, what are they, you know, okay, my, mine is food. What are they drinking? What are they, whatever. So I, I use my own palate because I, I get bored easily. So I'm like, hmm, I want ginger, I want masala, I want cardamom. And then you check, is the market big enough and would this make sense? Mm. So from there, we've gone into, you know, ginger tea. We've gone into flavored teas. As I've gotten older, of course, the milk doesn't work. So I've gone into fruits and infusion. I've done purple tea, green tea, orthodox tea. And actually, even during COVID, watching trends, 
Mm. Um, you know, you were not, people were not allowing everybody into the office. So we came up with a tea vending machine. So you just press a button, which you can have it here, you know, press a button and you actually have your tea. Oh. And um, now looking at the demographics, the youth are sort of, you know, less, you know, they're always in a hurry. So we have a tea on the go, which is an instant tea stick. Pop it in your bag, wherever you get boiling water, put it in. So it's really watching really the market and, and making sure. I think the other one is really um, continuous learning. Mm -hmm. You have to keep learning. You have to keep um, finding out what's going on, who's doing what and how do I do it better than them or what's going on in other countries that I can, I, I can learn from. And the third one is operational excellence. You really have to l run a tight ship. Yeah. You know, um, am I doing this better than somebody? You know, is, the, is this the most efficient way I can do this? Am I... Um, treating my suppliers properly, am I getting the best rates, ETC, because the margins in manufacturing, mar manufacturing is more a volume game, mm. so the margins are, are pretty thin, so you really, really have to make sure that um, you're running a proper ship. Let's talk industry now, um, because you find there isn't equitable participation of women, and that's from the C-suite all the way to the factory floor. You've been in this industry, this game for a while, mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure you've seen the gaps and the barriers. Mm -hmm. What are they and why do they still uh, persist? Um, yes, you're right. And um, when I was the chairperson of Kenya Association of Manufacturers, we did do the study that, yeah. um, um, that you are actually read up. And it is true that um, it is a male dominated, a little bit more than other industries. Yeah. So I am a big advocate of, um, you know, um, inclusivity and gender balance. And um, one of the things that keep it there is um, why do women start businesses? Hmm. Women start businesses, and this is, there's a study that says women start businesses, one, for freedom. I want to be able to take, drop, pick and drop, we're nurturers, so you want to be able to pick and drop your kids, you want to be able to whatever. Women start b businesses for convenience. Um, we, women start businesses for something to do. Whereas males start businesses to grow big, and also to get bragging rights, you know, profits and all that. So already the motive in a lot of them yeah. is very, very, very different. So that's the first thing I would say that um, needed, needed, um, you know, that does bring the disparity. Of course, there is a lot of gender biases. Women don't believe too much in themselves. Whereas you can have, I mean, like I, 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 I personally, you know, you, you, you have every, all the credentials, but you always second guess yourself. So these are, these are, um, obstacles that don't let um, the woman rise. Mm. In, in manufacturing, of course, being male dominated, it, women have always been overlooked typically. So we need to come in and educate people and say, you know what, they are competent. And um, this, you actually have a bias right here going on over here. And, and this bias sometimes is with, is with women and with men. You know, so there's a lot of training and capacity build, building that is actually needed in this space. So there are a lot of, um, obstacles and steps that, that also need to happen, which starts, you know, first the individual, and then followed by, you know, the society, the environment that you're working in, you know, um, where are the toilets, um, where, where, where are they put, where are they expected, what kind of, what, when are the meetings, are the evening meetings, are they daytime meetings? I personally, um, you know, you can have invites Monday to Friday. So it was just today somebody was saying, oh, I want us to do dinner on the second of whatever, and I said, that's not convenient. And he's like, why? You know, and I'm like, I actually don't even need to explain to you why. I just don't like doing too much of that. So I, I, I think it's sort of like um, for women to actually realize you can be part of this conversation. There are limitations, but there are ways to work around them. Always have, you know, um, somebody in the room who can always speak, um, find out a little bit more. Yeah. I always say there are meetings before the meetings. So always make sure that um, you're in those meetings before the meetings so that you don't have to be always present to actually make yourself heard. And, you know, finally, as we wrap up, because you spearheaded women in manufacturing at CAM. Yes. Um, and I guess because you saw the issue of most women manufacturers are MSMEs. Yes. And in the informal sector. And you want to see them playing a bit bigger. Like you said, most male manufacturers are thinking scale. Yeah. So how do you get more women to think that way in the sector? I think the first one begins with empowerment of self. Yeah. A woman needs to believe that it can be done. Think about it. Women are constantly manufacturing, whether she's knitting, whether she's baking, whether she's cooking. It is manufacturing. It is the base. So first of all, they've got to believe it can, it can be done. And secondly, see, this can, this can scale. So I think it's first of all empowerment. Believe it in the mind. It can can be done. When we were running the women, in, when I was running the women in manufacturing, we actually brought women from um, Southern Africa, 
um, West Africa, large women who were running. One was, was a cable, and she was serving cable, making cables for the whole of, the, the, of Southern Africa. Another one was making credit cards for the whole of Southern Africa. Another one was doing steel. So we wanted women to understand, you know, you can, you, you know, in your high heels, you can actually do steel and deliver to, to you know, to diff diff different um, plants. So one is empowerment. Um, um, nurturing them, storytelling, yeah. making them believe. The second one is financial support. Yeah. Remember, women typically do not own assets. Yeah. So um, I could want to take a loan, but, I, but the, the, I, I don't have an asset in my name or it's in my husband's name, my father's name or something like that. So the financial institutions today have really improved from what it was. You know, when I was starting in business, it was collateral and if it was cash collateral, even better or a piece of land which you, you don't own. So now with all these new ways of lending, debenture lending, mobile money, um, that is definitely something that is going to make a big, big difference. Capacity building, mm -hmm. you tend to find um, the women, especially in informal settlements, really have no, they, they don't have the time, they didn't, they didn't go to school or they didn't get an opportunity to upscale themselves. And then also in our schools, do we, we don't really teach business. Yeah. So a lot of capacity building, linking them to bigger, bigger um, organizations um, and, and also helping them come together. The whole circle mentality is powerful. You know, how can women who do, let's say, for me, if we use all our products in Melvin's are natural products, right? So I could, I could say, listen, get together and send, bring me 500 kilos of hibiscus. So several people getting together, come, coming together and actually, you know, pooling is something that is, is, is really also important. Mm -hmm. Access to markets, again, when you're together, if I get an order to send Kiondos to wherever I'm sending them to. I might not be able to do many, but together as a group, we will be able to do that. And also in that market, uh, um, access to markets, also linking them to larger companies, like I said. It's, a, it's an, something that has been used in the, the Asias, where they actually um, did what they call it subcontracting. So you, t you tend to find, oh, let's take a typical example. It actually happens. Yeah. In the EPZ, you get somebody saying, I, I do clothing, but I have no time to do buttoning. So they'll get some women, put them together and say, mm. go do, do these buttoning and bring them back by 10 o'clock or whatever time it is. Yeah. So there's a lot of linkages that we can do that does that. And the final one is really policy and advocacy. Mm. It is important to have the right policies in place, to have the right um, structures, to have um, you know, like the AGPO, you know, the one that supports the women, the affirmative action, buy Kenya, build Kenya. These are, these are things that will help um, reducing um, the bureaucratic hurdles, yeah. licensing. Um, it takes, I, I, I can't even imagine how many licenses we have to get. So formalization, the cost of formalization is, 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 is pretty high. And I do remember during the political, whatever people say, I'll make, I'll make a business, um, starting a business, one license and it will cover everything. <laughs> That's ideal yeah. and it's a good idea because those are some, some of the reasons that women keep away from formalization. Right. So if you, if you sort of deal with those and then, the, and, and then I think um, if you ask me of all those, the biggest one is the, is the, is the mental block. So the biases, um, we need to deal with that for the woman and for the society. Interesting. Strong sense of belief. Thank you so much, Flora. That's all the time we have. Uh, but certainly this is a conversation that we need to keep having to see yes. more women entering the yes. sector. And hopefully we'll see more of you uh, yes. in that regard. Yes, yes, definitely. Fantastic.